All right. We're in a series of messages. This is your first time to be with us. Uh, we're in a series of messages called Follow. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And we talk about following Jesus. We say Jesus set an example that we should follow, that you do what Jesus did. You value what Jesus valued. And then there are things that Jesus commanded, Jesus called us to do. He said, do this, do that. Don't stay away from this. Stay away from that. And today, we're going to look at one of the great stories from the Gospels. It's a story of Jesus calling out a guy named Matthew. Sometimes he shows up in the Bible uh, called Levi. But this is, this is Matthew. Matthew is one of the 12 apostles, one of the core disciples. And in his story, it's told in, oh, let's see, in three of the four gospel accounts. So, it's a, I could have taken it from two other gospels, but I want to take it from Matthew because we're telling about the life-changing story of a guy. We might as well hear him say it himself. There's a lot about his personal testimony that shows up in this story. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start out in verse 9. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those biographies of Jesus. If uh, you come across Malachi, you're 400 years too early or too late. Here we go. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And that's the story. There's a side story to this, an after story. As Jesus reclined at the table in the house... Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came out and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. All right, we're going to look at this story and in the listing of the 12 apostles. When that shows up in the Bible, the, the other guys, and they'll say, Jesus called, and these were the ones set aside to be apostles, and there'll be a list of the 12 of them. But Matthew does one thing the other guys don't do in their listing. When, it, when Matthew does it, he lists his name, and then he says, tax gatherer. Nobody else bothered to say, now they all know Jesus is, Judas is a traitor, but tax gatherer. No one else slapped that label on him, but he put it on himself. And I think there's a big reason why. Matthew, when he's telling, these are the apostles, he gets to his name, he just has to add something in to describe himself. There's something that he feels like people need to know about him. He was a tax gatherer. Now, I think... That the reason he adds that in is because it is his shameful confession of the life he lived. Of where he had been, where God found him, and what God did in his life to bring him to a whole new life. <laughs> in that confession, is I can't imagine being involved in anything more shameful, more disgusting. The most unlikely of candidates to be a follower, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Matthew. It would be the modern day equivalent of someone, uh, the way they saw it in the first century, it would be saying, involved in uh, heavily in sex trafficking, in selling drugs to children. It was, it was something that everyone would just recoil at the thought of. He is Matthew the tax collector. Tax collectors were fiercely disliked by uh, the general public. They were divided. The Talmud the Jewish Talmud is the collection of Jewish teachings. The, the civil law, the ceremonial law, it's summed up in the Talmud. And so as you read uh, the Talmud, it describes tax collectors. And it has two different words, two different descriptions of tax collectors. Some, they were just uh, kind of the ordinary general tax collectors. They collected taxes on wine, fruit, uh, similar items. Matthew is not that guy. Matthew's a different kind of tax collector. He was a custom house official. And that's a pretty big deal. The custom house officials had a lot of authority and they had a lot of power and they had a lot of abuse of power typically. 
So as a custom house official, he had the right of a search and seizure kind of thing. He could, somebody's coming through, he could open their baggage. He could, what do you have in your pockets? He could shake people down. It was an intimidating, bullying kind of role, and he was one of those guys. Now, he has an office where he's doing his work in Capernaum. Now, if you've ever visited Capernaum, it seems like a sleepy fishing village, not too exciting. If you'd like to visit Capernaum, you can go with me next summer. Shameless plug. Now, here's the thing about uh, Capernaum. So it's on the Sea of Galilee. It is a fishing village, but location, location, location. It is located on a major trade route that runs from Damascus, which is a significant trade center from Damascus right on down into Jerusalem. And so everybody coming and going, any direction, buying and selling, trading goods, they're going to have to pass through Matthew's collection booth. And his import tax, we've, we've learned, would run anywhere from 2 to 12%. Uh, Matthew, <laughs> this is a sidebar to his tax stuff. Most of it's trade, people traveling, traveling the trade route. But we also know that a guy like Matthew would have had to collect taxes from fishermen, from the professional fishermen working the Sea of Galilee. He's in Capernaum. That means he probably collected taxes from John, Andrew, from uh, Peter, from uh, James. He's collecting taxes from the guys he's going to be working with. I wonder, he's probably a little uncomfortable sometimes in those discussions early on as they're getting to know each other better. He's collecting taxes from other guys who are going to follow Jesus. Day after day, here's the thing about being a tax collector. He was hated, and he felt it. It wasn't a, yeah, I, I have low self-esteem, and I feel like people don't like me. No, it, it was clear people didn't like him. He, he was hated. And he felt it. And people glared at him. And nobody liked him getting into their business. And nobody liked what he did. And nobody liked how he did it. And it was a burden to carry around. And there are all kinds of reasons they were hated. First of all, tax collectors were terribly dishonest. The way the system worked is that high-ranking Roman officials at auction could buy the rights to tax a, a region, a province, a whole country. And so, then it was good for five years. So they would, at auction, purchase rights to taxation in a certain area. So this is like a Roman senator would have enough influence to be able to get into that level of the game. And then he'd farm, this, farm out the actual taxation process to local guys, people who lived in the area. He'd find someone who would be the ongoing collector. So here's what happens. The Roman government would say to the Roman senator, okay, now you have rights to this trade route between Damascus and Jerusalem. And this is what we expect to get back from you. And then you'll get a fee for doing, doing this work. But anything he'd get above that fee, that went into his pocket. So He's got his margins figured out, and then he works with the local tax collector and says, okay, here's what I expect to get from you guys. But they had the same trickle-down effect. Anything they got above and beyond what the boss asked for went into their pocket. And these guys, tax collectors like Matthew, could become very, very wealthy. Now, here's how they became wealthy, because the system was was created as a temptation. It was created, it was a broken system that it, it, just, it just invited people uh, into graft and corruption and fraud and extortion. Tax rates weren't published. Tax rates are complicated. Tax, tax systems are complicated in our country. In their country, you couldn't Google things. You couldn't look it up on the internet. You had no idea what your taxes even were. You just had to take the word of the tax collector who was most often dishonest. And if you said, well, Matthew, I don't think I should have to pay that. I think that's too much. I'm going to protest my tax rate. Well, if you did that, Matthew could say, well, let's ask the Roman soldiers how we f feel about that. Because we know from the Gospels, there was a Roman centurion who was posted in Capernaum. 
He's a significant guy, has a significant contingent of soldiers with him. And that's at least one Roman centurion. Remember, there's a, there's a story, Jesus healed the Roman centurion's servant. That Roman centurion had helped to build a synagogue. And so he's a pretty good guy, but you don't cross the Roman government with this guy even. And so here's this guy. And so if uh, you say, I don't want to pay my taxes, they say, well, let's bring the Romans over and let's see if you want to pay your taxes. And all of a sudden, they're paying a lot of taxes and quite quickly. The common people suffered in first century Israel because of excessive taxes. And the tax collectors were often wealthy. Here's another reason they were hated. Because Matthew, he's a Jew. And he is betraying. He's a traitor to his own countrymen. He's turned his back on his own people to work for an occupying military presence force, the Romans, who say, you are under our authority. He's considered a co-conspirator. Now, collecting taxes was the most despised of occupations. We find them in other Jewish literature. They're lumped together with harlots and heathens. Tax collectors, harlots, and heathens. In this passage and other places in the Bible, you find tax collectors and sinners. And the way the Jews thought about it, tax collector equals sinner. Sinner equals tax. Words could be used interchangeably. It was a terrible person who was a collector of taxes. We learn from the Talmud, other, other sources, that tax collectors were disqualified from being able to be witnesses in the court of law. Because they were so dishonest, no one could trust them. So they couldn't be a witness in court. We also know that they were barred from entrance to the synagogue. Tax collectors weren't allowed to come to the synagogue to hear from God's word, to worship God with other, other God worshipers. They were barred from the synagogue. We also know if a tax gatherer, a tax collector like Matthew said, well, I'd like to give some, we know that the Roman centurion, they took his money to build a synagogue. But here is Matthew. If he had come to the synagogue and said, I'd like to donate this large sum of money for the care of the poor, the money would have been rejected. You keep your money because your money is dirty money. So he, he's a guy that's he's just cut off, from, cut off from his own people, cut off from his faith and his God. He's, he's, he's a guy considered, he, he, he's just beyond the reach of God. God is, he is too far gone for even God to touch his life. So Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters for his ministry when he's in Galilee. He spends most of his time in Capernaum, in the region of Capernaum. And Matthew, in Capernaum, would have heard a lot about Jesus. Because he's the tax gatherer. He's, he's, he keeps up with everything going on with everybody. He's always in everybody else's business. So he knows everything going on in Capernaum. He's not going to miss what's happening with Jesus. Jesus is the talk of the region. So he probably would have heard that Simon Peter's mother-in-law was really, really sick and Jesus healed her. And then everybody in the area hears this story and they come bringing people to Jesus. And he heals them. He casts out demons. He is teaching the people. There's a lot of press about Jesus. He, he's, he, he's on everybody's mind, everybody's thoughts. He's, he's shaken up lives. Then one day, Matthew gets word, well, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they just walked away from their business. They walked away from their nets. They left their boats at the sea, and they followed Jesus. And, and then the story that comes at the beginning of chapter 9, there's a guy who's paralyzed, and Jesus heals the man who's paralyzed. And he's been healing people, but Jesus threw threw out something all new this time. He says, and your sins are forgiven. Oh, man. Now, for, for us, culturally, we may say, oh, well, that was nice of Jesus. Jesus does that kind of stuff. Sins are forgiven. For his Jewish audience, that was a game changer. Because when he said your sins are forgiven, he's declaring himself to be God because only God forgives sin. That was such a bold statement, such a big, broad, sweeping declaration from Jesus. Everything's changing now. Jesus says, I can forgive, not just heal, I can forgive sins. Okay, 
So now back to old Matthew, sitting in his tax collecting booth. He's heard all these stories. He leads this dark, difficult, isolated life. He, he knows he's a rotten person, and he knows he's doing rotten things. But he's trapped in this cycle that he can't break out of. And I picture him with his books, keeping his records. But he has to be thinking, because this is close proximity. We don't know exactly how much time elapsed between the first eight verses of chapter 9 and then verse 9. But I just picture Matthew just running this through his mind. Could he, could he really do that? Not just the healing. Could, could, he, could, he, could he really like forgive sins? Is that a possibility? And as, as he's mulling this over, I picture in my glorified imagination, I picture a shadow falls across his desk. And he looks up and he finds himself in the most awkward of situations. He is face to face with Jesus for the very first time. And what happens when you're face to face with Jesus? You know, we know in other places in the Bible, when people come face to face with God, the first thing that they realize is, I am a sinner. They're on their faces. They feel the weight of the holiness of God. Matthew is one on one with Jesus at, the, at his tax booth. He's got to feel the weight of it. A sense of conviction of sin. And there's a big question mark. Because he knows Jesus is a teacher too. Is Jesus about to unload on me? Is he about to tell me what? You are a terrible, godless, tax gatherer, sinner, worthless, outside the reach of God. Is Jesus about to just blow him right out of the water for the terrible life he's been living? He feels the guilt. He feels the weight. He sees it everywhere he goes. It's on his mind constantly. And instead, oh, uh, also, have you ever had uh, someone, you, you're talking to them, and then they stop talking, but they're still looking at you? An uncomfortably long silence, awkward silence. That's one of my question marks. I always wonder what happens between verses and between words. Like if Jesus, Jesus is standing there, he doesn't say anything. You know, Matthew trying to fill the, fill the void, fill the quiet. You know, we hate quiet. We hate awkward pauses. And they stand there looking at each other, looking at each other, looking at each other. And then Jesus says the one thing Jesus says. The most unexpected thing for Matthew. Follow me. Follow me. It, it was unimaginable for a guy like Matthew to think that a guy like Jesus would invite him to come overwhelmed by this invitation, overjoyed at the welcome. I think, I think Matthew just, and the Bible does it so fast, follow me, and he just stood up. And I think when he stood up, a whole lot of other stuff fell away. Because when he stood up, he says, and he just followed. He left everything and followed Jesus in that moment. He's, I'm, I'm turn, this, is, this is how it works with sin. I turn my back on sin. I'm going to follow Jesus. That's what it means to become a Christian. I'm turning from this life, and I'm going to follow God's perfect plan and design for my life and leave behind an old life. I want to be a follower of Jesus. And in that moment, I think he found this cleansing of sin. He found a new life, a new creation in Christ, all things new. Follow. He immediately obeyed. He just closed his closed his ledgers and followed. Now, uh, one thing, I think he, let, he he just left. He left it all right there and followed. One thing he took with him, though, for which I'm grateful, he took his pen. Because Matthew goes on. He's a detail guy. He's an accountant. He's a detail guy, and he comes back around as a detail guy to write down uh, great detail of the teaching of Jesus. Remember, we get the Sermon on the Mount in its fullest form from Matthew because he's a detail guy. I'm glad he took his pen with him. Now, no, no disciple gave up more, it appears, to follow Jesus than Matthew. 
he walked away from uh, what was a money-making operation, a position hard to secure. He gave up a whole lot to follow Jesus. You think about the fishermen in the crowd. They, they said, well, it's a bad week to be following Jesus. I think I'm going to go grab a, grab a net. I'm going to climb in the boat. I'm going to get back into business. We find the disciples periodically going back to the Sea of Galilee. But when you're a tax collector, custom house official for the Roman government, there's no going back. You, you, you can't walk away from that and say, hey, uh, save me a spot. Uh, he was done. He had nowhere to go, nowhere to turn, except to follow Jesus with all his heart for the rest of his life. He walked away from more than any of the other apostles to walk with Jesus. I think about, uh, uh, Jimmy Smith's going to be talking about this in a couple of weeks. There, there were different people that said, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus said, okay. But there are going to be some challenges to it. And they said, well, not so much. There are people who Jesus called to follow him, and they just came up with all kinds of excuses. Well, I, thanks for the invite. Love to do that. But I have this personal issue I have to take care of. I have some financial things I need to square away. I have some family things that are, that are more important than following you just now. And they come up with all kinds of excuses when it comes to following Jesus, whether it's at their own, well, I'd like to, as long as it doesn't cost me much. I, or the ones that Jesus invites, well... Excuse after excuse after excuse. With Matthew, his response was immediate, complete, rapid obedience. And it's, it's just this amazing story of God's amazing grace. One other application when it comes to a guy like Matthew that I really want you to make uh, we have a tendency as Christ followers to prejudge the spiritual soil we're working with. That we, where do you sow your gospel seeds? Well, we, we have people that we know some of their background. We know a little bit about them. And we say, uh, I could share with this person, this neighbor, this friend, this guy at work, this uh, lady from the gym. I could share, but I don't know. Because they're from a different religion, because they're from a different race, they're a different socioeconomic background, because I've heard some things that they've said about religion, because I've heard some things they've said about people, and because they're just going to be hard. They're not, and we, we, give, we answer in advance for people when it comes to the gospel. And we say, no, no, they're, they're not going to be open. They're not going to be open. And we prejudge the soil. And we assume too much. And we trust God too little. And I think Matthew's probably glad that Jesus took an unlikely guy and said, follow me. There's a story from church history. Uh, give you a little church history lesson. Uh, he's, he's, he's not an unknown guy, and his story isn't all unknown. His name is John Newton, and John Newton wrote... A song that shows up shows up in secular movies in our country from time to time. It uh, shows up in just about everybody's hymnal uh, in song a song list of Christian songs, the great songs. The song "Amazing Grace." It's written by this guy named John Newton. Here's a little of his backstory. John Newton was born in London, July twenty fourth, seventeen twenty five. He was the son of a commander of a merchant ship. His mom died when he was really young. When he was eleven, he started traveling with his dad. As a, still a very young man, he was impressed into service on a British man of war, the HMS Harwich. Uh, impressed means he didn't go volunteering, and it's a little bit more fierce than uh, being drafted. Uh, he, was, he was just told to get on the boat. Conditions on a boat like that, a ship like that, were intolerable. He was miserable, he was young, and he hated it, so he deserted. And they caught him. He was publicly flogged. He was put back on the boat. He was demoted from being a junior officer to being just a common deckhand. And he was miserable at all kinds of levels. So this is just the beginning of dangerous toils and snares for this guy. Still a young man, he requests anything to get off of, the, get off of uh, this 
British man of war. So he has to be placed as a deckhand on a slave ship. And he does that. The slaving industry was making a lot of money and it was dark and terrible. And he gets on the slave ship. He's in Sierra Leone in, East, in uh, Western Africa on the coast. And he's, he's still immature. He's still angry about a lot of stuff. And <laughs> he makes his whole crew mad and they end up selling him to, uh, to a guy who's working the slave trade who's married to a woman who is a slave. And John Newton works for her. He is the slave of a slave. And she was a horrible person. And the slave trader was a horrible person. And he lives this life as dark and horrible and brutal for several years until finally one of his father's old friends uh, comes upon him, finds out who he is, and does all the things necessary to get him out of this life, get him, now you're, now you're with me. And he continues to develop, and it's just a few years later that he's worked his way up. And now he is the captain of his own slave ship, and he is, he is taking human trafficking. He's taking slaves, delivering them to markets, and it's a dark and horrible world he lives in. The way he tells the story is that one night in a violent storm, he's trying to steer the ship through the storm. He's convinced they are all about to die. And so John Newton says that he, uh, with, the, with the wind and the waves and the rain beating down on him, he just cries out, God have mercy on us. And the storm begins to settle shortly after that. And they're delivered and he's, he's in his quarters later reflecting, of all the things, the life I've lived, where did, where, did, you know, kind of, where did that come from inside of me? I would call out to God. And he would mark that day, refer to that moment as his great deliverance. His great deliverance. He recorded in a journal. He said, all seemed lost, thought the ship was going to sink. But he said, I believe that God addressed me, spoke to me through the storm. Sometimes God speaks in a still, small voice, and sometimes God speaks in a mighty storm. But God's grace had begun to work in him. For the rest of his life, John Newton would celebrate the anniversary of May the 10th, 1748, as the day of his conversion. But this is how he referred to it. He called it the day of my humiliation. It is one of his proudest, his day of his humiliation is one of his proudest moments because it's when he said, not my will, but your will be done. I'm subjecting myself to the authority of God. I am surrendering my life to God and to his agenda from this day forward. And that's what it means to become a Christian. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come to his grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He wrote the song Amazing Grace. It was a personal testimony designed for a 1773 January 1st New Year's Day sermon to wrap around with this song. And you know, some would say, John Newton's outside of God's reach. He, he's beyond saving. He's, he's too far from, far from God to give his life to Jesus. And yet in God's grace... Don't miss this part. He's always saving sinners. That's what God does. He saves sinners. He reaches out to people far from God. There's another guy that was like that. And he knew he was like that. And he was always amazed by grace as well. His name is Paul the Apostle. And he said this when he's writing to Timothy. Late in his life, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. It's a guy, he had persecuted Christians, he'd arrested Christians, he tried, to, he tried to choke the life out of the early church, kept the gospel from spreading, and he became a new creation in Christ. Because God can work with any heart. No one is beyond the reach of his grace. And that's good, good news for a sinner like me and sinners like you. Okay, now we're closing in on something else because this isn't the end of the story. That's just, uh, 
That's just verse 9. You have over, look at my clock up here, over two hours to go in this sermon on our current pace. Here's what comes next. Verse 10. Because that's often how it works in the Bible. Matthew has this incredible conversion story, but it doesn't end in the moment he walked away from a tax booth. Because there's this scene that follows. Tax gatherers did not have many friends. Their Christmas card uh, reception was very limited. They didn't send many Christmas cards because there weren't many people that wanted to receive one from a tax gatherer. They did not have friends. The only people they knew were people nobody else wanted to know. And Matthew was so transformed by his relationship to Jesus Christ, he wanted his lost, broken, hurting friends to know Jesus too. So he hosts what, what are we going to call a Matthew party. And here's, here's how we know this. So Matthew's telling the story here. You, you look at what Mark and Luke tell about this story. This is a detail Matthew leaves out for whatever reason, but they add. What happens between verse 9 and verse 10? They go and it looks like, well, Jesus just crashed a party somewhere. They're at Matthew's house. This event takes place at Matthew's house. He, he opened up the doors, hospitality, invited his, his far from God friends to come to his home so they could meet Jesus. Now, they're the Pharisees, they're the, they're the rule keepers, they're the religious elite of the day, and because they felt so good about how well they kept the rules that they had created, uh, their own standards of moral and spiritual superiority, and they were offended. Jesus is hanging out with tax gatherers and sinners. He's hanging out with the people no one should, should hang out with. And they, they like to isolate themselves from their, uh, not, people who weren't their crowd. And Jesus laid bare this hypocritical self-righteousness. And this is what it says. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. That's plain enough. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous. Not call, call the righteous, but sinners. Now, in my, my personal life, I'm going to spend a lot of time with Christians. I'm going to spend a lot of time with other Christ followers because the Bible tells me I should. Because Christian community is vitally important to the encouragement uh, in my spiritual growth to service, to training. There are a lot of reasons why we need to come together with other believers. And Jesus spent a lot of his time with the 12 and with other people who were bought into what he was doing, what he was teaching, what he was modeling for them. But Jesus spent a lot of time, carved out space in his life, in his days, to be with people who are far from God, to reach out to those no one else was caring about, no one else is reaching out to. When we become a new creation in Christ, and that's, that's one of my favorite images of what it means to be a Christian, a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Everything is new when you give your life to Christ. Matthew got up from that table, he becomes a new creation in Christ. Paul on the road to Damascus, he... He becomes a new creation through his encounter with Christ. All things made new. I became a new creation in Christ in Victoria, Texas, uh, 40-something years ago now. Some of you know what I mean, a new creation. But when you become a new creation in Christ, there's a job description that always comes with it. And it doesn't come five years, ten years, fifty years later. It comes the minute you become a new creation. This is your identity in Christ. We are ambassadors and by this flows right out of the new creation language of 2 Corinthians 5. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are to represent Christ. You are to carry the name of Christ forward. Jesus didn't come to spend his time with other believers in some kind of holy huddle. He came to spend time with those who need a spiritual physician. People who need to know Jesus. Okay, I appreciate that y'all did not run out when you found this insert in your program. Because now we're to our main point of application. And I want to challenge you on this. Here's my challenge. You can do this. 
we have circles that we operate in. You have a circle of people you know at work. You have a circle of people in your family, circle of people in your neighborhood, different circles you, you circle in, your circles of influence, your spheres of influence. And our neighbors. Now, you have neighbors that are not by any account walking in a relationship to God. There's no clear evidence of a commitment to Christ. And so here's the challenge. To invite five of your nearest neighbors to come to your house and eat a meal. And I could ask you to go to Africa with me, but I'm, I'm starting here. How about that? And there's a 50-50 chance I'll get those people back from Africa. And there's a 50-50 chance you'll survive hosting people at your house to eat something. At least a 50-50, right? So... Uh, Sister Louise over here and I we both felt a burden for our neighborhood so yesterday oh my goodness yesterday we had over 60 people come up here for all day training and then went out into, the, into a series of apartment complexes just praying for people and uh, seeing if God would open any doors to share Jesus it's seven, seven adults make commitments to Christ it was a great day. Lots of doors of opportunity to go back with people. So it was, it was a great day. Well, Louise and I really felt our neighborhood that we share, we needed to reach into our neighborhood. So we have been going through our neighborhood. And we've been test driving some stuff. We're learning stuff. We're going out again this evening. Uh, test driving some, some ways to talk to people. And here's what we've been saying. And we found a huge open door. Because we say, we're just, we live here in the neighborhood. And we just feel like we just don't know our neighbors well enough. And we want to get to know our neighbors. And everyone goes, that is exactly right. No one knows their neighbors anymore. And the door just flies open. Uh, and then we, we're offering to pray for people. We've shared the gospel with several. Uh, building bridges uh, for, the, for Jesus to, to walk across. But that's, that's been the opening. And by the way, our neighborhood isn't covered up in rear entry garages like most of the neighborhoods in Allen. The house I was in before the house I'm in now had a rear entry garage. We, we, we went for months at a time. We didn't, know, we, we didn't know if they were really still there. Sometimes there would be lights in the window, but they could have had them on timers for all we knew. We didn't know if they were ever home or not. They didn't mow their own yards. The, the, they were never outside, so we, we had little opportunity. We had to really work at getting to know my neighbors ever. So what we're doing is just going up and saying, hey, we live in the neighborhood. We care about you. Anything we could pray for you, we're trying to get to know our neighbors. And people are really open to it. So, we know there's an openness. We think that this is a way to do this. So here's something to do. Choose five of your neighbors. Invite them to come to your house and share a meal. Now, I want to tell you this. I am, I am not asking you. Invite them over. As soon as they get in, lock the door behind them. Strap them down to a chair, pull out a big whiteboard, and start drawing circles on that thing. Uh, I'm, I'm not asking you to share the gospel, to give your personal testimony. You know, God may open doors for you and all kinds of things along the way, but, but this, is, this is the ministry of hospitality, and it shows up in the Bible in multiple ways. Hospitality is one of the spiritual gifts listed in the Bible. Uh, we find... Commands uh, in spiritual leadership in Titus, we're told hospitality is a part of what it means to be a spiritual leader. We're told in uh, Hebrews 13, uh, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for some have entertained angels without knowing it. I don't know how many angels you got on your street. I'm pretty sure I'm short on angels on our street. But Hospitality is a core Christian value that I think we've just thrown to the curb. And I know we, don't, we don't invite people to our homes. We don't invite other Christians to our homes. We'll, we'll go out and eat, but, oh, my home's not just right. Everything's not just the way I've always wanted. It doesn't look like uh, the, the TV shows that redo houses. It doesn't look like one of those places, so I can't have people over to my house. And you don't have to be perfect. Your house doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to be, op- be willing to open a door and invite people to come to your home. And I want to encourage you in this. You, you can do this. Set a, set a goal. 
we're going to do this, circle it on the calendar. This is, this is what works for us. So let's go and invite people to come to our home here. And then just send out the invitation. Go and knock on a door and say, hey, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get to know our neighbors. Would you like to come over? And we think uh, we're going to find a great deal of openness. Rhonda and I had God opened some doors for us a, a couple months ago. And we... We realized, oh my goodness, we, we've been neglecting this. So we got we have neighbors. We've picked out our five that we're gonna we're gonna go with first because of the event of a couple of months ago. Once we get that done, we'll we'll add some more. Now, please don't say I do need to invite five of my neighbors. See, I have four church member families living on our street. We have thirty houses on our street. I say I'll start with them, and then Rhonda and I make five. So I think we're all covered. Well, that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, we want to invite people who don't. Uh, we we need to build some relationships. Set a manageable goal. Don't make it overly complicated. Don't pull out the 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 fancy eating plates and the multiple forks. Make it really simple, simple for you, because ultimately it's not, oh, can I can I host the world's greatest dinner party? It's can can I get to know my neighbors better and know a little bit about what's going on in their lives? And there are different ways to do that. You know, do a little preparation ahead of time and we'll we'll send you some stuff. You can you complete this. I'll send you some stuff. That okay. Uh, so it's a married couple. How'd you guys meet? It's uh, somebody. Well, they're from a different culture. Tell me now. Tell me about your country. So what would be a common meal for you? T- uh, tell me. Tell me about where you work. Tell me about your kids. Tell me about your grandkids. Uh, get them all together because you can't just oh two over here, two over here, two over here, two over here and. You, you want a small enough group, you can keep them together a little bit and maybe throw this out. You know, thanks for coming over. We're just trying to get to know one another better. And we all live on the same street together. We don't know much about what's going on in our lives. And I'm not trying to freak you out or anything, but maybe just to get to know each other, what kind of what's going on with everybody. Could you just, we're halfway through 2017. Could you give me, my, give me your high and low for 2017 so far? What's the best? What's the worst? What's tough? What's good? Just give me your high and your low for 2017, real quick. And all of a sudden, you've laid all kinds of things on the table that you're going to learn some things, and, and then you have opportunity to you know, pray for those things later, or then to follow up on some things, to continue to go back. Hey, how's that going? I know you had that job interview coming up in a couple of, couple of weeks. How did that go? Praying for you. And you can build a relationship that opens the door for the gospel, that you can, you, you can share the gospel, and you can talk about spiritual things. And this is, just, this is just really basic. Uh, I, I want everybody here, we, we've said this now for, since January, everybody should be ready to share the gospel anytime with anybody. And we need to have some tools in our tool belt to do that well. And so, again, we're, with a lot of, lot of you have stepped up and you've jumped in and you're going strong and I'm so proud of you. Uh, but but some, I, know, I know it sounds like for a lot of that, like, okay, we're going we're gonna to cold call on apartments in Allen, Texas and knock on the doors and we have no idea what's going to happen next. And you go, okay, well, I'm completely freaked out by that. And... It feels like if this is a ladder, like the first rung is at, at about the eight-foot level. So this is low rung on the ladder uh, step. Invite people to your house to share a meal. And talk to them about whatever. And see where God moves from there. Hospitality is a tremendous untapped tool in the lives of believers and anybody can do this. Make it as simple. You know, we're going to grill some burgers. We're going to, we're just going to order in some food. If they say, would I, you know, can, can we bring something? Yeah, bring a dessert. Get them invested in the process. It's, it's your neighbors. And God puts you in that neighborhood to make a difference for Christ. Now, to do this, you have to kill a couple of things. Some things have to die. The first one is your sense of calendar. Because what is it that keeps us from doing most things in obedience to the Lord? It seems to be our calendar. I would, but I am so 
Yeah, busy. How's it going? I am really, really busy, everybody says. And, and so we have, we have shared this before. If you're new, you're going to maybe hear this for the first time. Instead of saying, I am so busy, just say this. I am so sinful. There you go. Go ahead and throw that one in there. Because if you don't have any margin in your life to ever, you know, how many, we, we talk about Jesus, uh, Jesus, Steps You follow in Jesus' steps. One of the other great opportunities is to follow Jesus' stops. How many times Jesus was on his way from point A to point B, and he had margin to stop. He made sure he had space when those opportunities arose. So, you need to have some margin. So, you're going to have to let your calendar die a little bit and just create a little bit of space on one day for this. Uh, so some of your calendar is going to have to die and some of your comfort is going to have to die because you go, oh man, oh, I don't know. I'm, for me, I, I can get in front of you and talk all day long, but you put me in a small group dinner party and I'm kind of freaked out because I'm an introvert at the core of my being. And so, oh, well, how's that going to work? And what's it going to be like? And what are they going to say? And uh, well, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there's a little step of faith that has to happen no matter what. So just be willing to do a faith thing. It's okay if you have a neighbor in the area, a church member neighbor. You can team up on this. It makes you feel a little better. Shoulder to shoulder, back to back. We're going to do this together. That's okay. But just take a step and say, I'm going to host a Matthew party. I'm going to put it on my calendar. and We're going to take a step to do this. Now, here's what I want you to do with these. I want you to fill them out. If you're willing to take this step, and I want you to hand it to me. Because I know how this works. We use commitment cards all the time. And a lot of people, okay, pass in your commitment cards. And everybody, everybody starts passing them down the road. There's not anything on that. You weasel. You're trying to make people think there's something on it. But I know there's not. So I want you to, I want you to, yeah, yeah, 20 years. I figured that out finally after 20 years. So just, I'll, I'll be the connection center right over here. You can just hand it to me. And say, pray for me. Because I'm going to pray for you. I'll send you some stuff. Some of the things I've shared, just the practical, here's some things to think about type stuff. Uh, we'll help you. And we'll definitely pray for you. And just see what God, God has put us here. We want, we want everybody in our city to have opportunity to know Jesus. And that's going to have to involve us getting into some neighborhoods. So I had a, I had a good number of people who handed me these at the first hour. I want to tell you about my favorite one. Yesterday, we had a team going out into an apartment complex. Young couple. Uh, he's a believer. She accepted Christ yesterday. And they said, we're Christians. I guess we're in. Sign me up. That was awesome. Not, not after I've been a Christian for 100 years. I became a Christian yesterday. And now I'm on mission because that's how it works. You're a new creation in Christ and we're an ambassador for Christ. Immediate. So that's our point of application. Now, if you, if you don't have a relationship to Christ, if you're not settled on that, it's so simple to say, I'm putting all my faith in what Jesus did at the cross. I believe what he did there can make all things new and I'm putting all my faith that he can make me new. And I want to surrender my life to him. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the master of my life. He's in charge. You make that kind of prayer commitment. Jesus comes into your life right then. And you're a new creation. And you're an ambassador for Christ. We're going to do some maybe new creation things today. I talked to somebody about that after the first hour. We're going to, we're going to do some ambassador things too. Let's join God in the great work he's doing. Because it's the great adventure of the Christian life.